Hi everybody. As promised, I said that I would go live and share my story of um, alcohol and drug addiction. I posted a vote, a poll on this page down below and it was, it was a tie between uh, to talk about alcohol and drug addiction or relationship problems. So uh, I decided today will be the day to talk about um, alcohol and drug addiction. So I am not a professional. I am not licensed to give advice or to um, anything like that. I just created this page for myself and for those that um, need inspiration or um, to let them know that they are not alone in any kind of situation that you're battling. Don't mind my hair. <laughs> my bangs are just all over the place. So I wanted to just share my story of um, alcohol and drug addiction and hopefully you can take whatever you want from, from it um, or you could just enjoy what I have to say. So I created this page to um, keep track of my progress on the sobriety, on recovery. Um, and I would have done it on my original page, but I don't want to overwhelm people and I don't want to annoy people. So out of respect of other people, I decided to just create um, this page so I could um, keep track of my progress every day. Um, I don't know where to start, but I have my, um, my book in front of me. I went to treatment um, a few months back and it was for um, domestic violence and we have learned about so many different things in the treatment program and um, I already got the permission to share um, what I've learned uh, to pass it on and they actually encourage um, you to speak about your journey and to pass on what you have learned to others because there are others out there that are probably going to need it um, just as much as I have so I'm just gonna read um, read this right now because I really like this it is a paper that they have given us um, the first day that we went to treatment and it says just for today just for today I will not worry just for today I will not be angry just for today I will be kind to every li living thing just for today, I will be thankful for all my blessings. Just for today, I will do my work honestly. Just for today, I will be compassionate and forgiving. Just for today, I will find joy in even the smallest of life's gifts. Just for today, I will feel at peace. So when I was in recovery and treatment, I would read this every day. Every single day when I woke up and every single day before I went to bed. Um, I find in my heart that it is um, very helpful if you're going through addictions of any sort, relationship problems, uh, if you're going through um, a hard time from uh, any kind of abuse or assaults or um, losing a loved one, grief, um, basically anything, I find it very helpful to read motivational quotes, whether it's for um, positivity, whether it's for motivation, whether, whether it's for um, uh, sobriety, recovery. Um, it's something that I do on a daily basis is I read motivational quotes every single time I, woke, I wake up and every single day before I go to bed literally throughout the day. I'm not going to lie, but it really does help me. Um, and me going to treatment has helped me become the best version of myself. Um, before treatment, before 2014, I am not going to lie, I was a very vicious, mean person. Um, and that was due to alcohol and substance abuse. Um, so my story, my journey goes back to when I was 12 years old. Um, I grew up in foster care um, at, a, at a very young age. At three months old, I got adopted um, into another family. And um, 
my mother, she was an alcoholic and my father was an alcoholic and I'm pretty sure a substance user. Um, so I wasn't raised by them and my mother decided to give me away for um, adoption to her cousin, um, Robert Frank, Frank St. Pair. And um, at three months old, I was adopted into their family, the St. Pair, Morrison and Turner family. And um, they have raised me as their own daughter from a very young age. And um, when my dad was a residential survivor, residential school survivor, um, so he was going through a lot of pain. And growing up, I didn't understand that kind of pain. I didn't know what they were going through. I didn't know why they did the things that they did. I didn't know why they were always drinking. But when you are, when your family's traumatized and you grow up in a traumatized family, you will grow up the same way. Um, and I've been through treatment before and I've actually learned it from treatment. Um, it's a big eye opener. I never knew that before. A ton of questions I've always wanted to ask is why were my parents alcoholics? Why were my parents always out partying? Why was I always left home alone? Or why was I always forgotten in the car? Um, the times that they drank. Um, and some days it would be just my dad uh, going out to party and stuff like that. And um, I always asked myself those questions over and over growing up all my life. And I finally understood that he was hurting from residential school, the things that happened to him. His pain was embedded into his blood. And me growing up with that, I always saw my dad drinking all the time. And um, he slowed down um, as he got older because of uh, liver um, conditions and uh, his body just couldn't handle it anymore. He'd always end up in the hospital or in um, detox and the doctors are saying, you better quit drinking, otherwise you're gonna kill yourself. My father never ever listened and um, he continued to drink whether it was a six pack a day. Um, he thought it wasn't no problem but every drink that he took he was risking his life and risking his body, um, further dam damaging his body. So I grew up in an alcoholic home but at the same time it was a good home. I was well taken care of, I was loved. Uh, we would go to church, we would have family dinners. Uh, when my grandpa was alive, he was a pastor or a priest. And our family was very, very into um, going to church every Sundays or family dinners. And so even though my, my parents drank, um, we were still taking care of each other a lot. And um, I remember being a little child and parties going on around the house. I remember being a little child and all the kids being in one house and all the adults being in the other house partying next door. Um, I remember being put in my room to be put to bed because there's people partying in the house. Um, just a lot of stuff like that growing up in an alcoholic home. And so when I was 12, um, well, before that actually, sorry, um, my, my, my family would have a lot of people come over and a part of healing is to talk about it and a part of healing is to be truthful about it and do, do not hold anything back no matter what it is. I've been to treatment twice and um, both times have helped me tremendously um, and my family already know what I've been deal what I've been dealing with and what I've been through my whole life. So I created this page so I could share my journey, share my story because I know out there there's more people that are struggling in the same situation or worse. So me growing up without my family, without my mom, by bi biological mom, biological family, I always thought like I was a black sheep of the family. I always thought that um I wasn't wanted. And um, that wasn't the case as I grew older. Um, my bio mom always tried to keep, keep in contact, but um, she was still an alcoholic at that time. So my foster mom wouldn't allow her to come see me. And um, it was just for the protection of me. And um, my mom 
was an alcoholic because of her upbringing and because of um, losing her sister just before or after I was born. And um, so many reasons um, that people drink, um, either trauma or being physically abused or being um, in a family that, uh, in an alcoholic home or a substance use home or being uh, sexually assaulted or raped. Um, I mean, there's so many reasons that people decided to drink and there's some people out there that just like to drink to have a good time and socialize, which is totally fine. But for me speaking, I am an alcoholic, I am a drug user, and I have an addiction. Um, people out there can drink and have fun, but me, I for one cannot do that because of my past and what has happened to me. I drink and then I can't stop. I do drugs and then I can't stop. Or when I drink, I want to do drugs. And it's just a cycle after cycle after cycle, continuous, continuous, continuous. So I created this page to, to um, hold me and myself accountable to remain sober and drug free. Um, and I wanted to share my story with all of you that are on this page because that is a part of healing is to always share your story no matter what no matter how embarrassing it is no matter how ashamed you feel no matter if your family gets mad at you for sharing the story or if they judge you this is my story and I have the right to share it and I've been told by so many others every time I share my story it it actually helps them it actually helps them heal it actually helps them realize certain situations and to better themselves and it actually helps them feel good inside so when i share my story i know i'm doing the right thing from inside because it's helping somebody else so as i grew up in an alcoholic home and an alcoholic family um certain things happen um without the knowledge of your family knowing um and at I'm not going to disclose any names. I'm not going to shame anybody because I have gotten over it and I have healed from it. So at the age of five, five years old, I was visiting um, my biological father in Terrace. And um, I rarely got to see my bio dad because he was never around. He was never in my life. But there were times where I would go see my bio mom and visit her and then she would let me visit my bio dad or my bio dad would come pick me up. So I went to his place and my bio dad was amazing every time he came to pick me up. Like he'd take me to the park, he'd take me swimming, he'd take me for ice cream. Uh, we'd do things together and it was just for that day or two. Um, and then I'd have to go back to my foster family. But when I was five years old, for some reason, I remember this. I was visiting my bio dad and we just finished having a good time and um, it was time for bed. So I went to bed and I was sleeping and I wake up to one of my bio cousins. He was older. He comes into my dad's room and I was on, I was on his bed and my dad lived in a trailer at that time. And um, he comes to the room and he sexually assaults me. Five years old, he was sexually, trying to sexually assault me. And at five years old, you don't know what they're doing to you or you don't know why they're doing it. But I remember physically seeing his face when I woke up and him trying to um, sexually assault me. And I didn't know what to do, I was only five. But thankfully my dad, my bio dad walked in and he saw my older cousin doing that to me. And I remember my dad just losing it and he freaked out and he literally grabbed my cousin and started beating the crap out of him and started yelling at him like, you're not supposed to be doing that. Who the fuck do you think you are kind of thing. And, and like he was disgusted and he was, he was like, really angry at my older cousin and I remember seeing my dad watching my dad physically beat the crap out of him throwing him around the trailer dragging him around punching him everything 
and he literally kicked him out and started fighting him outside. At five years old, you are traumatized for life. Uh, I still remember that to this day. And um, my dad came back in, a, in the trailer and he came and he just held me and he just cried and he apologized and he said he was sorry for me having to go through that and that he'll never ever let anybody else hurt me like that ever again. So that was a traumatizing event at five years old. And um, as I grew older, I kind of felt weird about it. I kind of felt awkward around my older cousin. Um, I was never left alone with him again, but there were times where I, I would run into him because we would have family dinners or gatherings or I'd see him around the reserve. Um, and I just kept my distance from him because I remember his face physically doing that stuff to me. So I would stay away from him for good. Um, and then again, at 10 years old, my family were throwing a party and so many people were at the house. I once again was in my room by myself while my family was out partying in the living room. And one of my, my, my parents, um, their best friend, so-called best friend of the family, would come into my room while I'm sleeping, 10 years old, and he would try to physically assault me, sexually assault me. Um, I remember him coming into my room and I'm under my blankets and I remember the first time waking up and he's running his leg, his hands up my leg, trying to physically touch me. But at 10 years old, I already knew that was wrong. I already knew that somebody's not supposed to be doing that to me and I would I would I would like be I would be crying and I would be upset and I would try and move move his hand away and like stop him from doing that to me and then there are times where he would try and kiss me and I would move my head like that or I would stop his face um, and he was an older older guy like he was my parents age and he was doing that to a little 10 year old and i remember he would come by on purpose to get my parents drunk and to party with them and so my mom and my dad would pass out on purpose he would do that and my family at that time didn't realize it but I remember being 10 years old and he was always doing that. He would always come by and drink up my dad, get him drunk, drink up my mom, get her drunk so they would both pass out. And he would come in my room again after doing that and then doing it to me again. But he would never get close because I wouldn't allow him to. He would just fill me up or try and feel my chest or try and kiss me or try and touch my private areas. But... At that age, I already knew it wasn't right. So I would always stop him or I would always run out of the room or I would always go and try and wake up my parents and stuff like that. And he would always tell me, don't tell anybody, don't say anything. And um, I remember going through that for a long time. Um, and at 12 years old, I just had enough of it. Um, I remember meeting a lot of my friends and I remember um, telling my friends about it, my closest friends about it and uh, I remember my friends feeling remorse for me and sorry for me and I remember my friends always coming over to visit me because they didn't want nothing happening to me anymore and I remember I would always go and visit my friends because I didn't want to be in that situation or be in that environment where I'm being sexually abused or sexually assaulted at home. So I was always out visiting and I remember 12 years old, my friends were having a party, a house party, and I've never been to one of these. And they were smoking up, they were smoking weed, they were drinking, and at 12 years old, I remember sitting there and I remember joining the party. I remember smoking a joint for the first time. I remember drinking a 40 pounder of Silent Sam for the first time. And I remember physically getting so, so hammered. And um, I got so drunk to the point where I called my mom and I called my dad and I met them at the gas station and my little cousin was there with them. And um, my dad didn't give me shit. He just told me, um, I hope you learn from your lesson. And my mom was just reaming me out. I would go home 
really drunk, really intoxicated, and I would throw up, like literally throw up. And my mom, my dad's just laughing at me basically. And my mom, she's like just reaming me out and don't ever do that again and you're grounded and blah, blah, blah and all that stuff. But deep down inside at that time, they had no idea what I was going through. They had no idea how I felt. They had no idea the pain that I was feeling, the how scared I was feeling just to be home. Um, so I would go out and drink and I would party with my friends. I would smoke weed with my friends and it was just a ongoing situation for the next six years. Um, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And to this day, I really, really wish that I listened to my mom. I really wish that, you know, I didn't drink at a young age. I really wish that I didn't do the drugs that I did at a young age. But when you're traumatized and when you're being sexually abused, there's a feeling of guilt and shame inside and you feel disgusted with yourself even though it's not your fault and it's the other person's fault for doing that for you i mean that's what led me to drinking and doing drugs um and i just kept partying and partying and partying and there are going to be people out there that say, oh, it's your fault because you decided to party. Oh, it's your fault because you decided to drink and not take care of yourself. We do not know what's going to happen to us. We do not know if there's going to be another time where you get sexually assaulted. We are not aware of those things. So when we're out partying, we're enjoying our time. And there's so many times where people have told me it's your fault. It's your fault because you're doing this and you're doing that how could people say that to another person instead of judging them why not try and understand their story instead of judging them why not listen to them and listen to like understand them try and understand what they're going through before you say it's your fault um it just makes me sick when other people judge other people and when they say it's your fault um this one day I was 15 years old and um, I went out partying with a whole bunch of my friends. We were partying outside at a park in Prince George and um, I remember getting uh, intoxicated. Um, so intoxicated where a few of my friends had to bring me to another friend's place and they thought I would be safe there. And I was so intoxicated to the point where I couldn't walk. Um, and they, I had my friend on this side, I had my friend on this side and I literally couldn't walk. So they had to carry me to my friend's place and she was home. And at that time they were throwing a party at her, at her place, at her mom's place. And so they put me in her room and they thought I would be safe. I thought I was going to be safe. I hardly remember. Um, but I passed out right away in her bed and, um, I remember the next day waking up and I was completely naked um, 15 years old and I wake up at my friend's place and I was completely completely naked and I remember waking up thinking what the hell happened why am I naked and I remember seeing one guy laying to the right of me and I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I remember feeling scared shitless. And I remember trying to find my clothes. I wrapped myself with a towel. I went upstairs asking people what happened. They don't know. And um, I went back downstairs and I see another guy laying at the foot of the bed. But he was like, he was all bloody. His face was bloody. Um, and he looked like he got beat up. And I remember, why is there two guys laying in the same room as me and I'm completely naked? And the person that was laying beside me woke up and he's like, do you want me to walk you home? And I said, yeah, I want to go home. So he walked me home halfway, walking me home. He told me, I need to tell you something. And I said, okay. And I was like, why, why did I wake up naked? And he was like, that's what I need. That's what I have to tell you. So he told me that he walked in to my friend's uncle raping me. And he said 
that he lost control and he started beating the hell out of that guy and um, he doesn't know how long he was raping me for but he said that I was completely out and he's the one that took off all my clothes and he was raping me and he said he beat them the hell out and he knocked them out and he said that he covered me up with a blanket and then he passed out but in my head at that time I was thinking why didn't you call my parents why didn't you call the police why didn't you tell the owner of the house what was going on it doesn't add up it doesn't make sense I got to my house and I cried to my mom and my grandma was there and I cried to her and they were both crying my mom was shaking my dad was angry they called the police the police came and they um, talked they came to talk to me they took my clothes that I was wearing that night they took a statement from me I gave them all the details down to both of those guys names to where they both might be and to what he what uh, that guy told me what happened to me they asked do you remember anything and I said no I don't remember nothing at all they rushed me to the emergency to the hospital to do a rape kit and um, they gave me day after pills um, so I wouldn't get pregnant and they gave me other pills so I wouldn't get uh, translate tra um, sexually transmitted diseases um, so I had to take a whole bunch of pills um, and they said you have to wait two weeks for the t for the kit for the kit to come back um, to see if we could find any DNA on you and my cousins my uncles my brother heard about it my brother got gathered all his bros all his friends and they went to go hunt this guy down and they said that they they were going to physically hurt him to the point where he couldn't walk no more my brother and his friends went up to my friend's place kicked down her door and they told her they told them that he went back to his hometown and so I told the police that the police found him brought him into custody and he recalls he doesn't remember so after that two weeks goes by and the cops come and they have a paper and they sit me and my mom down and um, they told me that they found two two DNA inside my body and I said what do you mean two that can't be possible um, because that guy was saying there's only there's only that one guy that did that was raping me and the police said that well the story doesn't doesn't add up of what he was telling you and what you're telling me if a person walks in and sees somebody get raped they would automatically call the family they would automatically call the police they would automatically get you out of there anyway doesn't matter what's going on but he did not do that and for him to be laying beside you the next morning it doesn't make sense so they told me that the guy that was laying beside me and the guy that was at the end of the bed they both were raping me and i just remember crying and crying and crying because the guy beside me i've known him for a while and i trusted him and so the police were asking me what do i want to do what do you want to do i said i want to charge him i want to charge them both and i want them both to go to jail for what they did to me so the police um, said, okay, we'll set a court date and you could show up and you could tell your statement to, you could give your statement to the judge and to the Crown Council. And so that's what I did. I waited for court and when court came, I stood up to the judge and to the Crown Council and I told them everything um, from my knowledge. And um, I pointed out to those two guys that raped me. I said, They're the, those guys are the ones that did it. He did it, he did it. And um, the Crown Council decided to um, prosecute them. And I went home and the police came l not long after and they told me that they have been charged with rape and they um, are, are in jail and they're not going to be getting out. And not too long after, um, one of the guys dad's our family member passed away and he wrote me a letter asking if he could get out and to go to his family member's funeral I, th I believe it was his dad's funeral and the police told me that I could um if I say yes he could get it he could be let out for one day but if I say no then he's not allowed out 
and I for one didn't care who the hell his family died who you know if he wanted to get out for that one day to go to the funeral I did not care because of what he did to me so I told the police no I don't want him getting out at all he could serve his full time in jail for what he did to me so I found out that they actually got they actually were in jail for four years um, so they they served both of them served four years um, for for raping me um, and I was 15 years old and I remember my mom trying to bring me to um, see a counselor in Prince George at the Friendship Center I did for one day but the counselor didn't seem professional she didn't really give me advice she didn't really try and help me um, so that was the end of it and at the age of 15, I remember just being out of control, being so angry, being so hurt. And I remember um, continuing to party. And um, I was at a hotel party and I remember somebody walking in with a shit ton of Coke. And I was 16 years old and I remember like, what is that? And I remember my friends telling me what it was and asking me to try some. 16 years old, that was the first time I've ever tried Coke. Um, and I remember being hooked ever since. Um, and every time I drank, I would want to do Coke. I would want to do a line. And I would meet different friends. Um, and I would be in different places, different situations. And it would lead to um, different situations. And um, I was no longer smoking weed, I was doing coke. And um, I just remember falling into, that was the beginning of falling into um, substance abuse, falling into drug addiction. My family had no idea what I was doing. They had no idea where I was. They had no idea that I was doing any drugs at all. And I remember just lashing out on them, never being home, not even caring to being home, not even coming home except for to change or to shower or whatever. And there were times where I'd invite the party to my house, disrespecting my parents because I was so angry and I didn't give a shit what they thought. So with all that being said, that's where the substance abuse led to. Um, and it actually got worse and worse and worse. I fell into um, crack addiction um, and it wasn't my drug of choice. I didn't like it. I thought it was disgusting. Um, so I continued to do coke and then I remember doing coke for about four years um, on and off every time I partied um, and I remember being with um, men, my past relationships, guys that I've dated, they were drug dealers and um, substance abuse users and alcohol. They would drink and we would party. And um, it was just a cycle that I wasn't aware of at the time. I didn't know that I had a, a substance abuse issue or an addiction. At the time, I didn't care. Um, and at that time, I was very, very, very vicious. I was so mean to everybody and anybody. At the age of 12, I started fighting, physically fighting, because there were girls in Prince George that hated the crap out of me, that didn't want no part of me, that told me to go back where I came from. So I was always having to defend myself. And there were times where I'd fight four girls and one guy at once. There were times where I'd get jumped after just walking down the street with my mom. There were a lot of times where I had to defend myself. I would go to the carnival and I would fight three girls. And it just be, it just allowed me to become stronger. And so um, I was about 21 living in um, Vancouver. And I remember partying down there. And I was working in the salon and I was making so much money that I would just party it away. Or, or shop it away everything that I wanted I would buy and I remember being in Vancouver and like who the hell am I gonna get drugs from so I remember getting it from an actual restaurant which was so weird and I remember doing coke um, beside the ocean um, and just 
partying with friends and being at house parties, meeting up with friends, being at house parties and doing drugs um, and drinking. Um, so it just continued and um, at the age of um, 22, uh, my dad and my mom would come down and they would visit me because they had um, medical appointments and um, my dad was still an alcoholic. My mom would drink occasionally. Um, so they, they came down in 2012 and they came to visit and I remember just getting paid and taking them out to um, go shopping. And it was my little sister's birthday. I believe she was 10 or 11, 11. And I remember taking them all out shopping. I remember taking them to a nice restaurant. I remember having um, beer with my dad and sitting down and just talking to him. And um, it was time for me to go home. So I went home and not too long after, a couple weeks later, my mom calls and she says, your dad's in the hospital. And I'm thinking, I, yeah, I just saw you guys, like what's going on with him, is he okay? No, he's not okay, you have to come home. He's in intensive care unit and the doctor's saying that he doesn't have much time. And me thinking like, how is that possible? Like you guys were just here, he was just fine. And my mom was saying he couldn't go to the bathroom no more. He couldn't eat no more. Um, he was feeling sick for a long time. Um, and something's wrong with him. And my dad's stubborn. He hated the hospital, so he would never go to the hospital. But my mom finally said, you have to go, something's wrong with you, this is not right. So my dad went and he ended up in the intensive care unit. Back then in 2012, my family did not tell me what was going on with my dad. They didn't tell me what happened to him. They didn't tell me anything or that he was dying from drinking or from uh, alcohol abuse um, that is liver and his body was shutting down they did not tell me that when i was when i was in 2012 so i was thinking what the hell's going on with my dad my dad's strong he can make it and so i flew i flew from vancouver to prince george because i had no idea how long my dad would survive or how long he would live for and if i took the bus it would literally take eight hours or hours just to get to prince george on the greyhound so i decided to buy a ticket there and when I was ready to go home when everything was clear I would fly back to Vancouver so I showed up at the hospital my family whole family was there from Gitskukla from Terrace from Kispiax from just Prince George everywhere the hospital was packed and I remember walking into the hospital and everybody was looking at me like like they didn't know what to say um just with a sad look on their face and I didn't know my dad was hooked up to all these things or I thought he was awake. I walk in the room with my brother and um, I see my dad hooked up to all these machines. I see tubes down his throat. I see tubes down his nose. I see a whole bunch of things all over his chest and his body was swollen. And me not being aware of that, I literally, literally lost my shit. I started crying profusely and I was really hoping to talk to him and to let him know that I'm there and I remember holding up a painting that um, I got some guy in Vancouver to do for him of a uh, Elvis painting he painted it right in front of me and he signed it and I remember wanting to give that to my dad physically because I thought he'd be awake but when I walked in that room he was on life support and me thinking like my dad's strong, my dad's tough, he's gonna make it through. That's what I kept telling myself over and over and over. And um, I went up beside him and I told him, dad, I'm here, it's Isabel. And my dad gave me a nickname called Square. Um, and my dad would always call me Square. And so he, I would tell him that. I said, dad, I'm here, it's Square. Uh, it's your daughter, I'm here. Please make it through, you're gonna be okay. And um, I remember being so heartbroken um, because of what my dad was going through, being on intensive care, uh, in the t intensive care unit and being on life support. And um, I just remember crying, 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 crying. I went home, I laid in my dad's bedroom, I laid on my dad's bed and I held his pillow and I remember smelling his pillow and smelling him 
and just the scent of him and my mind was just going crazy and I was praying to God. I was asking God, please don't let my dad die. We still need him. He's only 62 years old. I'm only 22. I still need my dad. And I remember just crying and crying and crying and physically screaming into the pillow and crying myself to sleep. I end up falling asleep. And the next morning we got a call saying your dad, uh, Bob's awake, Robert's awake. And um, he's asking, he's asking for you guys. So we automatically jumped up, rushed to the emergent, rushed to the hospital. And um, I remember walking into his room and they were, they had these things on the side of him so he could stand up and pull himself up and get out of bed because he was um, in the intensive care, care unit for about a week or two. And he was laying on that bed for so long that when he woke up, they need to get his um, body um, back to functioning so I'm happy I'm like yes my dad's my dad's awake my dad's alive he's gonna make it he's gonna come home and I remember being so happy and they moved him into the family uh, family room where all the family could sit with him and share meals with him and talk to him and all that stuff and my dad kept saying he's gonna go home in four days four days I'm gonna go home and I'm in my head at that time, I thought he was physically going to come home with us. But at that time, I didn't know he meant something else. And I remember him talking to family. I remember the family sharing meals with us, dinner, making soup, bringing fried bread. Everybody from around the world, like around places where they're visiting my dad. Um, I remember my granny praying with my dad, holding his hand and praying with him. I remember sitting beside him and physically holding his body and holding his hand and laying on him and crying, still wanting him to be better. And as the days went on, he kept sleeping. He was sleeping and sleeping for hours and hours and hours. And I put the Elvis picture that um, some guy painted in Vancouver, I put it on the wall to the side and every time my dad would wake up he would look at that picture and he would smile and um i remember my granny and so many people holding his hand and holding his head and praying and i'm thinking why are why do they keep praying why do they keep speaking in Gitsen? like i don't understand what they're saying and i remember my mom crying everybody's still crying i'm like why are you guys crying like dad's gonna be okay and I remember walking out of the room and going to the hallway, sitting in the hallway, and I remember crying. And my sister came and she told me, she said, you just missed what dad said. And I said, what did he say? And he woke up, he raised his hand in the air, and he thanked everybody for being there. And he said how much he loved us how much he loved his wife how sorry he is for the things that he that he's done in his life um how grateful he is for everybody being there and how much he loves his daughters how much he loves his wife how much he loves everybody and he said um he's scared he's scared to to pass away and he doesn't want to pass away and i remember my granny being there just being by his side praying for him telling him that it's okay it's okay trust in god trust in faith and um everything's gonna be fine and to just let go i wasn't there when she was saying all that stuff that's the stuff that i missed him saying but my sister told me that's what he was saying and he said that he doesn't know who's gonna walk me down the aisle when i get married and when my sister told me that, I literally cried and cried and cried because I was thinking when I get older, I'm going to be married. I'm going to want my father walking me down the aisle. But at that time, he was worried about that. He was curious on who was going to walk me down the aisle when I get married. And that just broke my heart. And I remember... Um, my mom asking me, babe, do you want to stay in the hospital and watch your dad and um, be here for him? And I remember telling my mom, no, I don't want to. I'm scared because what if he, what if something happens to him? I'm going to lose my, I'm going to lose control. And my mom was like, well, okay, me and grand will spend the night with him again. 
and I remember going home and I remember just crying and crying and crying, wishing my dad would be okay because he was always sleeping when he was in the family room. And um, I went to bed and the next day, um, the next day my mom called and I answered the phone or my sister answered the phone, one of us, I can't really recall, but she told, she said that um, dad's gone. And I'm like, what? no he's not he's he's still there and she's like no he's gone he passed away he died and she told me the time that he passed away he stopped breathing and i remember like telling her like yeah right don't joke about that it's not funny and she was like you have to come you guys have to come back to the hospital and say your goodbyes the doctor's telling us we have to say goodbye and so we went to the hospital and i remember walking down that hallway and everybody was crying all my family that were there were crying and screaming i could hear people in his room crying and screaming and i remember walking in and at that time i had no emotion no emotion at all i walked into my dad's room and i see him lying there and i remember walking up beside him touching his arm trying to wake him up dad wake up and i remember just um feeling his arm and his arm was so cold and it was hard and they covered him with his favorite tiger blanket because uh he was a part of the Gitsukla um Skeena Tigers and um I remember feeling his face and his forehead and it was so cold and hard and he, he was pale and that was when I knew he was gone and I remember crying and I stopped crying and I looked around and everybody was crying and I can hear people talking like like why is why isn't she crying hard and what's wrong with her and is she gonna be okay and all that stuff and um, I remember it, it became too much and I went into the hallway and um, I just stood there kind of like in shock I wasn't crying and I remember an elder coming up to me and and giving me a hug and telling me it's gonna be okay and you have to be strong be strong for your mom and watch over your mom uh, take care of your family and right now you're in shock you're in shock that's the reason why you're not crying and you're gonna be in shock you're gonna be in shock for a long time but the day that you are not shocked no more you're going to lose it and you're going to lose it so hard to the point where you're going to need somebody there with you. When you realize that your dad is literally don literally gone and he's not coming back, you're going to lose it. And you're going to need somebody there to be there for you so you're not alone. And um at that time I didn't understand what they were what that elder was saying and I just acknowledged what that person was saying and I was like, "Okay, and I remember for days, everybody was crying and crying and I couldn't cry. Um, at his memorial, I couldn't really cry. At his funeral, I couldn't really cry um, until the day that we buried him. I started crying and I started losing it and I felt like us burying him, being at the grave, I didn't want to leave after we buried him I wanted to stay there forever and I remember my mom just crying and crying and I remember like it was kind of sinking in like he's gone and like he's not coming back and we're never gonna see him again and um, days went on and I remember feeling so angry inside because I prayed and I prayed and I prayed to the creator and asking the creator to please do not let my dad die. Please give him strength. Please keep him in this world because we need him. I was only 20 years old, 22 years old at that time and he was only 62. We shared the same birth month and October. And I remember being angry at God at the creator and thinking like you are bullshit you're not real I fucking hate you 
you let my dad die you didn't let us keep him longer and I prayed and I prayed and why didn't you answer my prayers and I remember going back to the house in Prince George after we were done everything we went back to Prince George and I remember being in his room just screaming literally screaming out loud and my mom was in the living room and she was crying and crying and crying and I was so angry I was so so angry that I just wanted to just do something stupid I just wanted to go on a rampage I wanted to fight anybody and everybody I wanted to just break anything that was in, in my in my face or in front of me I remember being on my laptop and I found out that a few of my friends came to Prince George uh, shortly after my dad died and they were throwing a hotel party. So I remember going over to the hotel party and I remember um, partying and um, I just remember after 2012 for three years, literally three years partying, doing drugs and not taking care of myself and not even taking care of my mom not taking care of my family not taking care of my responsibility that i was supposed to and i was just angry at god and angry at myself and angry at my dad and just hating life and not even caring about life anymore and i just kept drinking and drinking and running into more people that weren't good for my life and um i ended up seeing a guy that was um a drug dealer and a drug user and um i remember being at a party and i was so drunk i asked my friend to order me a 60 bag of coke and she went out and she came back and i remember chopping it up on the table uh, we're all partying and I remember snorting it and as soon as I snorted it it burnt so freaking bad it burnt my nose so bad and I got mad I was like what the fuck is this shit and she's like oh um it's meth and I'm like what you're feeding me meth when I asked you for coke like who the fuck are you I don't do meth I've never done meth in my life like, how fucking dare you give this shit to me? And I threw it at her. And I said, you fucking keep this shit. And I remember being so fucking, so high on that drug. And I had no idea what that drug was. And I remember going home panicking. Like, oh my God, I'm on something that I don't know what I'm aware of. So I remember being high and searching it up and realizing what it was. And they call it speed. They call it meth. Um, they call it side and um that was it that was the end of my coke addiction i started fiending i started having withdrawals for meth and i wouldn't smoke it i would just snort it um and i remember being at parties and the guy i was dating was selling that stuff and I remember doing that stuff with him and being at parties and other people doing it and for years my mom was at home crying and I was out partying and doing drugs and not even caring for life anymore I remember not even caring for myself not even wanting to care for myself I remember just being like I gave up after my dad died, I gave up on myself and gave up on life. <clears throat> so for three years, I was a I was a hardcore alcoholic. I would drink every day to the point where I couldn't even get drunk no more. I would do drugs every day um, to the point where I'd wake up and do it. I'd go to bed and do it. I'd do it all day. And I became a meth addict. Um, and it took it took a toll on me and it took a toll on my mom because i was disrespecting her i was lying to her i was stealing stuff from people i was becoming this person that nobody wanted to be around anymore i lost a lot of respect from my family a lot of respect from certain friends and i remember just being so lost where i felt like i was in nothing but darkness and I felt like I was going in a spiral into 
like literally hell. I felt like the devil was taking control of me. I felt like I saw nothing but blackness. And I remember being, after three years of doing drugs, um, co cocaine, meth, um, and stuff like that, I remember sitting at a party and I see people shooting up heroin right in front of me. I see people smoking meth right in front of me. I see people doing coke in front of me. I see people selling drugs in front of me. And I remember being in this house where so many people were just doing nothing but drugs. And I was sitting there and I felt like I had a vision where I could see my, my body right here, but I was up above it. And I was looking at myself, down at myself. And at that moment, I was thinking to myself, like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? This is not me. And I remember like feeling shocked, like, whoa, like you need to get out of here now. This is not where you're supposed to be. You're so much better than this. So after that, I remember leaving and I remember um, going home and I remember crying to my mom, telling her everything, telling her how sorry I am, telling her how stupid I feel, how ashamed I feel, how disgusted I feel. And it was an ongoing cycle to try and get myself off of the drugs. And um, I remember going back to a party and um, just everybody was doing drugs again. And I remember being drunk and being so high, doing coke, doing meth, doing um, molly, MDMA. And I remember um, the guy I was dating at the, at the time came in and he was doing drugs and I was like, oh, can I have some what you have? And he was like, no, I don't want you ever touching this shit. And at that time I didn't realize what it was, but I did it anyways. And my sister got so mad at me because she was doing drugs as well. And, um, one of my sisters and she got so mad at me and she's like, why did you touch that? Do you even know what that is? And I said, no. And I remember trying to fight her and trying to fight my other sisters and trying to fight my mom and um, my bio mom. I went to her place and we're partying in the basement and um, I had no idea what I just did um, until after. Uh, my mom kicked me out and she said, I'm gonna call the cops on you because I went berserk. I literally lost it. And the next day I messaged my sister and I said, what was that drug that I did? I don't remember. And she said it was down. And I was like, what do you mean down? What is down? And she said, heroin. And I'm like, yeah, right. No. And I was shocked. I was literally shocked. I said, no, I've never, ever touched that stuff before. And she said, well, that's what, that's what you're, that's what that guy was doing. And that's what he was selling. And you did it because you were angry and you were so high. You didn't realize what you're doing. And I was like, what the fuck? And I got mad and I got mad at that guy. And I said, how could you let me touch that? And he was like, I tried stopping you, but you wouldn't listen. And that was the first time I ever did heroin. Um, I ended up snorting it uh, up my nose and it made me become this person that was so vicious and so angry. I tried attacking all my sisters and my mom because I was high on that drug. And um, I told myself that was it. Like I'm literally done, no more. Um, what started off with smoking weed, doing shrooms, and then doing coke, and then doing crack, and then getting into meth, and then heroin. And I know what heroin does to people, and I've lost family members due to heroin. I've had friends um, overdose on heroin, and I just told myself, no, this is it. And I wanted to change my life, and I was 23 years old at that time and I remember telling myself I am completely done I need to get away from Prince George I need to move I need to focus on myself so what I did is I deleted everybody in my phone I deleted everybody in my Facebook um, I deleted all the contact numbers and I remember going back home telling my mom I had enough I want to change I need help and I want to move I want to get out of here so we came back to Hazleton Kispiox area and um, it was August, August of 2004, 2013. 
and our 2014 story and um we're visiting family and my grandma was really sick and um i i decided to take care of her and um just coming off of drugs i was having uh withdrawals i was sweating i was going through this um situation where I was kind of like suffering but I knew it's what my body needed I knew it's what I needed to make this change and um, I decided to take care of my grand for two weeks and she actually got better she improved and um, before I came to Kiss Biox in 2014 I met my boyfriend who I'm with now Jeremy and um, he just came from treatment and he was a year sober and drug-free when I met him so I remember being in Prince George and my cousin, one of my cousins were living with us and I told her, I said, I had enough of this life. I don't need it no more. I want to find a guy that's sober, find a guy that doesn't do drugs. I want to marry, settle down, have kids. I want to build a, a good life. And I was opening up to her and I told her all this and little did I know somebody was messaging her at the same time saying the exact same thing. And so she put two and two together and she introduced us um, through Facebook and he called me and I remember talking to him on New Year's and I was partying with my family. There were no drugs involved, just alcohol and it was New Year's and we're all dancing, having a good time at the house. And um, he called me and I remember wanting to meet him. And um, so we went back to Kispiox and my cousin's boyfriend just got out of jail so they were having a dinner for him and um i remember driving back driving past this place that i'm in now and i see jeremy standing outside having a cigarette and jolene my cousin stops and she pulls over and she introduced us and as soon as he peeks his head down in the car he gives us he gives me this big handsome beautiful smile and I'm like is that him is that Jeremy and she's like yeah and I'm like yeah right and she's like no it is and then right then I could literally say my life has changed um and every day I'm thankful for meeting him and him coming to my life because I could literally say without him I would still be on the streets, I would still be doing drugs, I would still be drinking, I'd be, I'd probably end up in jail or I'd probably be dead right now. So when I talk about him and I talk about the life change that I've come through and that I've overcome, I'm not crying sad tears, I'm crying happy tears. I'm crying grateful tears and um, I feel so blessed to share my story with everybody and to actually make it public on my page because the moment that I met Jeremy I knew he was the one I knew I wanted to be with him I knew we were going to be together and um I remember just being so excited and I'm like oh my god I want to go see him I want to see him and um she was like well go see him go visit him and I'm like no I'm too shy and I'm too scared and she's like oh just go over there so I walked over to go see him and his grandma was still alive and he had um full custody of a son and I remember knocking on his door like a weirdo <laughs> and uh the first day we met we just clicked um and his son was so shy he was only like five or six at the time and I remember coming in and his grandma was in the room and um he was feeding me freezies all night feeding me freezies do you want a freezy do you want a freezy do you want a freezy and I kept saying yeah 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 and I remember October 2014 when we started um hanging out and um I remember I mean January 2014 we started um right after we met we started hanging out and visit I started visiting him and we would go back to Prince George because I still live there, but I would come back every month, literally every month to visit him and his son and to hang out with him and to spend a few days with him or spend the weekend with him. And I remember the first, um, the vehicle that he had, uh, I remember every time I was around him, I felt safe. I felt loved. I felt cared for. And the first time that I met him, I was nothing but honest with him. 
I opened up to him about my drug addiction. I opened up to him about my alcohol addiction. I told him the truth about my past relationships, the times that I've been abused, um, the times that I've been raped, sexually assaulted, um, growing up in an alcoholic family. I told him everything from as little as being five years old or being first born. I told him everything about my life and all the trauma that I've been through, all the hurt that I've been through. And he shared to me how long he's been sober, how long he's been clean. Um, and I just knew like I wanted to be with him and I needed to be with him and I wanted to grow a life with him, build a life together, have a family together, get married. I knew then he was the man that I wanted to be my husband and I wanted to be his wife. And so every month for nine months, I would visit him. And October, 2014, I, I came here to visit my gran and um, I was telling him, I, I really want to move here. Um, I, I haven't been doing drugs since I met you before I, before I came here actually, when I first started taking care of my gran, I haven't been doing drugs. I've been drinking, that's about it. And I told him, I, I'm ready to move here and he was like well I'm not gonna force you to do what you don't want to do but if you want to move here that would be awesome where would you live and I remember talking to my gran about it and she was like oh you could you could come live with me babe and you could come stay here and this will be your room and I said oh awesome thank you granny and so I October 8th I messaged him and I said okay done deal I'm moving here I, I moved here I'm gonna live here and I'm not going back to Prince George. And he was so happy and he was like, are you serious? I'm like, yep. And he's like, where are you gonna be living? And I said, with my grand, just across the street from you <laughs> and down the street from you. And he was like, okay, that's awesome. He's like, I'll message you back. And I was like, okay. Two days later, he messages me back and he was like, uh, I have the green light. I'm like, the green light, what do you mean? Um, I've been talking to my mom about you and I told her everything that, um, who you are and, um, everything about you and, um, she gave me the green light to date you. And me in my head, I'm thinking, what? You asked your mom to date me? And he was like, yeah. Um, I tell my mom everything. My mom's my best friend. And in my life, my whole life, I've never met a man like Jeremy, um, a man that would ask his mom for permission a man that would notify his mom on any decision that he makes in his life and so I felt really grateful and I was like wow and um so he was like um do you want to make it official I'm like what do you mean like Facebook official and he started laughing he said yeah and I'm like you want to date me and he was like yeah I do I want I want to be yours and I want you to be mine and I'm like, yes, okay, let's do this. And he was in, he was in camp, working in camp on and off. And um, I offered to take care of his son and to come to his house and watch his son and help his, grand, his grandma around the house. And so he said, okay. And um, so I was taking care of his, his little boy and his grandma and cooking and cleaning for her and making tea for her and helping her around the house and taking care of his little son, making sure he goes to school. And I remember that it was just the beginning of something that was amazing and beautiful. And I remember laying beside him one day and I'm like, why me? And he was like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, why did you choose me out of all the women that you you could be with? I mean, you've seen other women. How come you didn't choose them? And he was like, because you're different. You're different than anybody around here that I've been with. And um, uh, I see something in you. And I'm like, okay, really? And he's like, yeah, I want to be with you. And that's where it all began and that's where my life started changing making drastic changes um mind you i was still drinking i was still going out partying once in a while but i wasn't doing drugs and um i just remember my life changing from there and me and jeremy have been together for four plus years um we've had our ups and downs um and i mean the rest is history um, 
I don't know what else to say. It's already 622 and I've been rambling and rambling on about everything. I literally shared a lot of stuff, more than I thought I would ever share. But um, I'm happy I made this page because I'm holding myself accountable every day to um, remain sober and drug free. Um, it's coming up three weeks of being sober and um, four and a half years, almost five years. Um, um, not touching heroin again, so it's been a long time since I've um, made that mistake of touching heroin um, when I wasn't aware of what it was. Um, that first time that I tried it, that was the day that I told myself I'm never ever going to touch it again. Um, because I've had a few friends that have died from it and I had a few friends that have um, became very high, like, highly addicted to it to the point where they sold themselves. Um, started pros pro uh, prostituting I think that's how you say it and so I told myself then I'm never gonna touch it again um, but I mean I still have a hard time remaining sober um, I just have to keep my distance from certain people and isolate myself and just focus on my life and my boys and um, our life together um, so every day I wake up and I read motivational quotes. Um, the quotes that I share on this page are the quotes that I read and I'm happy to share with everybody. Um, but yes, I do have a past and yes, I was a hardcore drug user and yes, I was a hardcore alcoholic and yes, I've been raped. Yes, I've been sexually assaulted. Yes, I've been physically, physically, physically abused by many um, men, by many different situations, by past relationships, guys that I've dated. Uh, yes, I've almost been killed multiple times. Um, I mean, I've been through a lot, a lot in my life to the point where people are like, I'm so amazed with you, like you've changed drastically. If you knew who I was before 2014, you would not believe it like you would not know like that's Isabel I was crazy I was fighting anybody everybody I wouldn't let nobody fucking disrespect me I would be out partying in the clubs strip clubs hanging out in freaking crack shacks dope dealers houses I would be um hurting people physically I would I seen a lot of stuff where other people hurt other people and i it's just a horrible, horrible life to live, a horrible, horrible way of living. And I, I was never this person until I met my partner, Jeremy. I've changed drastically. Um, I mean, it just gives me the shakes talking about it. It makes me feel scared talking about that kind of stuff because to this day, like this day, I am positive, I am happy, I am loving, I am forgiving. Um, I live a better life now than I have ever lived in my whole entire life. Um, and just talking about the past of me being that type of person just scares me because I know that I was that person before and I know the damages that it's done and I know the people that I've hurt by being that person and I know that I cannot ever, ever go back to being that person. And I do not want to ever go back to being that person. So this is the reason why I created this page is to um, remain, do whatever I can and everything that I can to share my story, share my experience, to help other people and to help myself. Um, so yeah, I've come a long way, a very long way. Um, and I'm very, very grateful and thankful to where I am today. I'm not perfect and I don't try to be perfect. Um, and I don't know what else to say besides I'm blessed to be here and I'm grateful um, to be sober and to be drug free. It's an everyday battle, I'm not going to lie. There's days where I have troubled days there's days where I feel like shit there's days where I feel ashamed because of my past it comes up um there's days where I feel like I just don't want to get out of bed but it's just emotions you know you got to control your emotions and you got to remain positive um for a healthy outcome of living um but other than that that's what I have on alcohol and drug addiction um that's my story 
sorry, my story of uh, alcohol and drug addiction. Um, I was going to read stuff out of the book that I've been taught and that I've learned, um, but I've been talking for an hour, I believe, or longer, um, and I'm supposed to actually be cooking dinner right now. Um, my hubby gets off at 5.30 and it's already 6.30, so he should be home any minute now. And so I think that's, I think I did pretty good on sharing everything. And if you tuned in, um, in the middle of this video, you could rewatch it once I upload it. So you have a better understanding of where I've come from and how far I've come from the beginning to now. Um, I still have a lot more to share, um, a lot of different topics to share and I'd be happy to share. And if you enjoyed this live video, please let me know in the comments. That way I know to share more things. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about tomorrow is um, relationship problems and that is going to be a long video because I'm going to be talking about all my personal relationship problems, uh, the past boyfriends that I've dated, the things that I went through with them, um, the heartache, the trauma, the abuse, the um, just everything that I went through with past relationships and my relationship now. Um, it's another drastic change and... Um, if you enjoyed this, just feel free to keep watching and to stay tuned to the rest of my um, live videos. <sighs> this is a part of healing. When you want to heal, you share your experience. You let other people know, whether it's a friend, whether you invite somebody over, have tea or coffee, go out for coffee, and you just share your experience. Do not be ashamed of what you're going through. Do not think that you are alone because you are not. And always know that somebody is there for you. Your family loves you. Your friends love you. And you just have to have faith and have hope and believe in yourself that things will get better because they will. Trust me. I've been in the dirt. I've been in the mud. I've lived on the streets. I've done drugs. I've done horrible things to people, to myself, to my family. I've been an alcoholic. I'm always going to be an alcoholic. But it's recovery you know it's an everyday situation where you have to recover every day you have to believe in yourself every day and to not give up on hope to not to never ever give up in yourself there were times where I was suicidal there were times where I just wanted to kill myself there were times that I've actually tried but I was never successful so I'm saying just never give up and do not be ashamed of sharing your story Never, ever be ashamed of sharing your story and do not hold back. If you need to say something, say something. Do not take shit from nobody and do not let anybody walk all over you. And that moment that you have a voice, continue to have that voice because there's going to be many people out there that are going to want to hear it. And it's not, it's not only going to help you heal, but it's going to help them heal. So that's the reason why I'm sharing my story and I'm very, very proud of sharing my story. Um, with all that being said, I better cook dinner because my honey's gonna be home any minute and he's gonna be like, why isn't dinner ready? So <laughs> with that being said, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for being a part of my journey and being a part of this page. Turn on the notifications so you never miss out on anything and I'm glad I'm able to help and I don't know. I just feel happy. I feel content and I feel blessed. So I hope you all have a good night, a uh, blessed night. And just remember to continue walking the road and continue healing with whatever it is, whatever you're going through. You're not alone and you're strong. So have a good night and um, I'll be going live t tomorrow again to talk about um, relationship problems. So I hope to see you there and if you feel like you want to share this video or feel like you want to share any post on this page, feel free to do so because I know there's going to be another person wanting to hear the same thing and wanting to know that they're never, never alone. If you, want to share, if you want to save the photos or share the photos, uh, the motivational quotes, go for it, positivity quotes, anything, go for it. I give you permission. Um, this is a public page so... Do what you want and take what you want from it and if it's not for you that's totally fine it's not for everybody um 